Assalamu alaikum everyone. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Okay, let me begin. All praise belongs to Allah. We praise Him, we ask Him for guidance and forgiveness, and we seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evil of our actions. Whom Allah guides, no one can lead him astray, and whom he leaves astray, no one can lead him back to the right path. I bear witness that there is no other deity but Allah by himself, no associate to him, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. O you who believe, fear Allah as he should be feared, and die not except as Muslims. O you who believed, fear Allah and always say a word directed to the truth that he may make your conduct whole and sound and forgive you your sins. He that obeys Allah and his messenger has then attained the highest achievement. So today I'll be talking about the amazing divine system that preserved the Holy Quran and continues to preserve it. So let's start out by th thinking about gratitude. Hopefully we have all been thinking about gratitude this week. And let's think about our gratitude for our faith and specifically for the Holy Quran, because that is the source of all our faith and strength. Other blessings in our life come and go, but the Holy Quran is something, and the faith that we derive from our beliefs is something that we get to keep forever. So today we will reflect upon the preservation of the Quran, and Alhamdulillah, we all have easy access to the Quran, a physical copy, an online, maybe apps. We can access the Quran, however, and whenever we want to. And the thing with blessings that become so common is that we don't truly appreciate them sometimes. And they just, we start taking them for granted. So sometimes when I pick up the Quran, I think about how this book is the distillation of all the wisdom ever revealed to humanity. There were so many prophets that Allah sent throughout the ages, and all of those prophets faced, <clears throat> excuse me, different circumstances, and they faced so many challenges and so many hardships, all for this guidance. And then Allah sent his final prophet, peace be upon him, and the guidance that he sent him with went through so many trials just as the blessed prophet went through trials. His life was in danger most of the time. And everything he did was to preserve and save this faith and pass it on to us. So thinking about that blessing is immense. Sometimes a question can come to our mind that how do we know that this Quran that we have with us is the exact same original Quran that was preserved in the time of the blessed prophet. So I will share a little bit of information about that. So our primary source for this is the Quran itself. When we read in chapter 15, verse 9, Allah says, And surely we have revealed the Quran, and surely on us is its preservation. So Allah Ta'ala being the Rahman has systems in place before needs even arise. And so that is the beneficence of Allah. So Allah had set up a system for preserving this Quran for all times. In the very first revelation from Allah, we, those five verses that were revealed, we see the words coming, who taught by the pen, who taught humanity what they knew not. So in these verses, we see as if instructions are being given to the Blessed Prophet on how to preserve the Quran, and then it will be preserved through writing, and it will reach all other people. In chapter 75, verses 17 and 18, Allah says, Surely on us rests the collecting of it, it meaning the Quran, and the reciting of it. So from the Quran, we find these evidences. We also find that Holy Quran is called the Suhuf, meaning written pages. This is in chapter 98. We know that there's verses in chapter 56 that talk about no one touching the Quran except the purified ones. So this leads us to believe that from the very beginning, the verses of the Quran were written down in a physical form, and so only the purified were supposed to touch them. Then we see that there are many occasions in the Quran in chapter 11, 17, where people are giving a challenge to produce a chapter like it. So a chapter similar in its glory, in its wisdom to a chapter of the Holy Quran. And this could not have been done if the verses of the Quran were not organized into chapters from the very beginning. 
So this gives us proof that they were organized. The verses revealed were written down by scribes or katib, and this is also mentioned in the Quran in chapter 80. So let's talk about the ways that the Holy Quran was preserved in the Blessed Prophet's time. So in the culture that the society that the Quran was sent to, writing and memorization were both parts of their culture. They used to preserve their history and they used to preserve poetry through their memory and also through writing. And so both of these things happened. The entire Quran, as it was revealed, it was written down instantly. It was also memorized and it was acted upon. So all of those things happened. The blessed prophet directed the order of the verses. It was not arranged in the chronological order, but it was arranged according to the subject matter. In chapter 25, verse 32 of the Quran, it says, and those who disbelieve say, why has not the Quran re been revealed to him all at once? Thus that we may strengthen the heart thereby, and we have arranged it well in arranging. So the wisdom is given to that so much wisdom cannot be absorbed instantly. It was revealed slowly according to situations, according to a need, so that people could absorb the wisdom and make it a part of their lives. In the time of the Blessed Prophet, a huge amount of stress was laid on learning and teaching the Holy Quran. Its verses were recited in prayers, in Juma, in the Hajjud, and many companions knew the entire Quran by heart. So there were, those are all modes of preservation. So of course, in the time of the Blessed Prophet, the whole Quran could not be collected in one form because as long as he was alive, the Quran was being revealed. So nobody could say when a certain verse would come to be added to a certain part. And so the full collection as a volume had to be done after the death of the Blessed Prophet. And this duty fell upon Hazrat Abu Bakr who on Hazrat Omar's advice collected the manuscripts of the Quran that were already written down into one volume. And this task was given to Hazrat Zaid and he started to collect only the original manuscripts that were made in the prophet's presence. So he traveled around and collected those manuscripts and made sure that those were the ones that were written down in his presence. So this was done in the lifetime of the blessed prophet Later on, what happened is that there were some variations in the mode of reading the Quran that came to the attention of Hazrat Usman. And even though permission was given during the life of the Blessed Prophet to read the Quran in different dialects, because some people were unable to read in a different in the dialect of the Quraysh. Because as we know, those of us who are non-native Arabs, it's very hard to make those sounds unless you've been taught since childhood. I know I struggle with that. But what happened is that as the Islamic kingdom grew, um, these differences were noticed and it was worried that they might lead to changes in the Quran, in the understanding of the Quran, even though the differences were very minor. And so Hazrat Usman consulted all the companions of the Blessed Prophet and they agreed that they should preserve a standard copy of the Quran and it would be preserved in the dialect of the Quraysh and the companions agreed to this and therefore that was done. A standard copy was made and all of the other copies were then burned and that standard copy was then spread throughout the Islamic uh, kingdom, wherever Muslims were. And even though later on, we know that Hadad Usman was martyred, there were many people who were against him and many objections against him, but this was never something that was a charge against him that he, you know, he in some way was not honest in the collection of the Quran. So that is the same Quran was spread by his opponents. You know, it was one standard copy that was agreed upon. And Alhamdulillah, now we find, even though there are so many different Muslim groups and so many different ways in which the Quran is understood. However, the copy of it is standard and the Arabic text is standard. Of course, people will understand it in its own way, but it is quite miraculous if you think of it and how this beautiful book has been preserved in its entirety and it's been spread throughout the world. So after the time of the companions passed, the physical preservation of course was done, 
but everything decays over time unless it is preserved. So we see that um, the, the saints that came throughout history also helped to preserve the Holy Quran and its meaning and to make sure that its message was being fully understood by everybody. So let me, yes. I say this saying of mine and I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. In the second part of my khutbah, I will talk about some practical implications of this preservation of the Quran in our lives. In the name of Allah and exaltations be to Allah and blessings and peace be upon the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So now that we have this beautiful treasure that we call the Quran, what is our responsibility? Is it enough that we have this preserved Quran with us? Is it enough to have a beautiful copy to maybe display it in our home, to put it on a shelf? How can we keep this message alive? Because we have a responsibility. The bigger the gift, the greater the responsibility. So making space and time in our lives for the Quran is extremely important and bringing it to the center of our lives. When we look back to the time of the Blessed Companions, the Quran was the heartbeat of their society. They talked about it. They read it together. They discussed it. They truly valued it. And when they memorized it, it was with the application. They usually would not proceed with just memorizing it till they had, make, they had tried to apply it as much as they could. So when we read the Quran or even look at it or hold it, we should be mindful of the immense sacrifices that have been made to bring this faith to us and how we have inherited a treasure. And when someone gives us a treasure, we have to take care of the treasure. And also we have to share it with others. So whenever we read and learn something, trying to share it with others, donating our time and money for this cause to help share the Quran with others is really important. And to remember that the Quran has been preserved for all times because it has a timeless relevance. This is not a relic of the past. The stories of the past are the stories of the present and the future. And so when we read the Quran, we have to think about that. How do we make this relevant to us? If there's something that we struggle to understand, are we continuing to struggle till we get it? Are we asking enough people? Are we consulting enough sources? And when we think back, you know, the morals and values of humanity have always been the same ones. They have not changed, whether there's new technologies or whether new situations arise. Uh, some of the basic challenges always remain the same and what's good is always good. So our challenge is also to know enough of the Quran that we can refer to it. Just like, you know, when I think mostly all of us do that, I know at least I do that, that whenever I'm doing anything, the voice of my mother is in my head. She will, I will think about what would she say about this? Oh, I can hear her saying, don't do that. Don't waste water. Don't open the tap so much and things like that. So I hope that we all get to the point where that voice of the Quran is in our head. Whenever we're doing something, we know, oh, this is the advice that Allah gave us. These are his commands that we can follow. And so we don't even need to consult the book. It has become so familiar to us that on general matters, we know enough about it to live our life in that light. And everybody has their own angle and dimension of understanding the Quran. And naturally, with the diversity of humans, that surely was Allah's intent. That it should not be understood just one way or according to one time, but according to all different times. And so with our scientific advances, modern sciences, some people will understand it from the viewpoint of psychology. Other people will see it from a different point of view. But what's most important, I think what we need to unify over is our love for the Holy Quran. That can we love this book more than we love anything else in our life so that we devote a lot of time to it. And that can start with five minutes, right? When we wake up in the morning or just making time maybe before every prayer, we read a verse or two. Maybe the last thing we do at night is to just open the book again and read a verse or two. Small steps can be taken to achieve big goals. 
Servants of Allah, Allah commands justice, the doing of good, and liberality to kith and kin, and he forbids all shameful deeds and injustice and rebellion. He instructs you that you may remember. Remember Allah the supreme in glory, and he will remember you, and be thankful to him, and he will increase you in bounty, and seek his forgiveness, and he will forgive you. And had taqwa of Allah, he will make for you a way out of your issues. Thank you very much for listening to my khutbah. I hope that everybody can take something of value from this. And let's all, when we pray, we should pray for each other too, that we help each other to understand the Quran, to apply it in our lives, to make it a central point in our lives. Jazakallah, assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah.